So it's a great honor to be here on the territories of the Mississaugas. And I'm hoping that all of you are willing to get into a lot of trouble with me so that we can make the world right for all children. Because we have the power to do it. But we will have to get into some trouble. You know, uh, I have such a great honor for the work that you do every day on the front lines. And uh, I actually think that you are reconciliation's best hope. Well, let me take that back just a bit. The children that you interact with are reconciliation's best hope. If we together can raise a generation of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children that never have to recover from their childhoods, and a generation of non-Aboriginal children who never have to say they're sorry. Can you imagine the type of country that we would have and the type of example we would set to <laughs> Children are not politicians, of course, uh, and they're not lawyers or doctors, but they are experts in something that is fundamental to the human spirit. And that is love and fairness. And that's why they're so good at reconciliation. Children know when something's unfair. And they want to do something to put it right. So I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes here some examples of where children have taken the lead in reconciliation. And these examples are set for those of us who are adults to learn from them because children are really good at reconciliation. And something that's interesting about Justice Sinclair, I think many of you admire him as much as I do, he was the chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He said, when it comes to reconciliation, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> and children are not afraid of the difficult truths of our country. They truly have shown me that they're able to understand it without feeling ashamed, but instead turn that into a motivation to create a better world for everyone. One of the myths about residential schools is that nobody back then knew any better. Um, and this is a pervasive myth in Canadian society, and it's completely wrong. Uh, this is one of my heroes. Uh, his name is Dr. Bryce, and in fact, the day before the apology for residential schools made by Prime Minister Harper, I found myself in Beechwood Cemetery at his grave. I had bought a bunch of uh, brightly colored flowers to represent the brightness of children, and I went down to see Dr. Bryce, and I wanted to thank him for everything that he tried to do. And I told him I would be back when the kids won the case. And uh, I fulfilled that promise. I got my snow boots on uh, early January, and I went and I told, read him the judgment. But this is a doctor. He was actually a very well-known physician of his time. He was the first uh, medical health officer here in Ontario. He wrote the first health code in North America. It's been used as a model for many others. And he was a um, prolific uh, scientific writer. He was the uh, chairperson, the president of the American Public Health Association. But at 51 years of age, which is how old I am, he was hired by uh, Duncan Campbell Scott to go out and survey the health of the children in the residential schools. This is in 1904. And what you see before you is actually the Ottawa Citizen in 1907. And it was called the Evening Citizen then, and you can see there on the front page is Dr. Bryce's report. What did Dr. Bryce find? Well, he went out and surveyed the health of the kids, and he found that 24% to 25% were dying each year. And if you followed them over three years, 48% were dead. All from preventable disease. He noted that if medical science knows just what to do, so these children's lives could be saved, was the good news. And he comes back to Ottawa, and he tells the Prime Minister, and anybody would listen, you must urgently provide these resources. And he says it's not a lot of money, it's ten to fifteen thousand dollars, which was the amount of money that was being sent in the city of Ottawa at that time for tuberculosis treatment and prevention. But he's saying you spend that amount of money for all the children, all these schools, and you can save them. 
So what did the government of Canada do? Well, they didn't want to spend the money. So what they decided to do is uh, just ignore this report, which was not okay for Dr. Bryce. Even though he was a public servant, somehow, and no one really knows why, but most of us have a suspicion it was Bryce himself, this report finds it its way into the front page of the Ottawa Citizen. Bryce had hoped very much that seeing this report would be enough to create the, an angst in the public that would demand that the federal government does the right thing for children. This article didn't just appear in Ottawa, it was replicated in papers across the country as far away as Victoria, PC. But he screamed into silence. No one really listened. And Bryce continued to step up his advocacy, his research funding was cut, he was pushed out of the public service, but he was never silent. He always believed those children should be saved. Now Bryce wasn't the only one that was speaking up. As you know only too well, it's often children themselves that speak up for themselves and their other friends, isn't it? It's the children who are sometimes our best advocates. This is a letter written by literal Edward B. And it's sent in a Christmas season of 1923, uh, just a, a number of years after Bryce publishes his second report called A National Crime, trying to get the public uh, to pay attention to the deaths of these children. So this is a year later. And you can see Edward is talking about how hungry the children are and the school he's going to, that they're having to eat wheat and cats, and that he's being treated cruelly by his teachers. You can see it's addressed to Dear Parent. That letter found its way into the hands of Duncan Campbell Scott, the senior official at Indian Affairs. And what did Duncan Campbell Scott say? He said that 99% of the children in the schools were too fat anyway. And he ignored the letter. There were people within the department who would say to Duncan Campbell Scott and to other senior officials in the government, we won't even bring these, what they would call, adverse reports to your attention anymore because you never do anything with them. You never do anything with them. So you can see here that reconciliation, changing this history, is about listening to those people who are telling us what the needs are, but taking action, right? Taking action. Can you imagine if all of us in this room were receiving Dr. Bryce's award, uh, report, what we could do now to save those children's lives? But that opportunity is not behind us. It's actually with us right now in this generation. And we have to change it because the, circum the consequences of standing still are profound. Some of you may have seen this when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its report. The chances of dying in a residential school were higher than of someone being sent off to fight in the world wars. And these were children, right? A lot of people don't want to think about the government of Canada as perpetrating these types of injustices towards children. But when you stand back, when you really look at it and you think, what are the greatest human rights violations of our time in our history of the country? They've been the Chinese head tax, the internment of Japanese Canadians, the turning back of Jewish refugees to face the horror of the Holocaust, the residential schools, the more recent persecution of Muslim Canadians. And they were all done by the government and all made possible because we let it happen. Governments don't create change, they respond to change. Right? Now, what about now? What can we take from this lesson of Bryce and uh, of Duncan Campbell Scott? Well, some of you may not know that the federal government requires First Nations communities to use provincial laws of education, child welfare, and health on reserve. And that itself is a matter of controversy. Because those laws have not proven to be particularly good for First Nations children. But nonetheless, they apply. But the federal government funds the services for First Nations, whereas the provinces fund it for all others, often with transfer payments from the feds. 
The problem becomes, as Sheila Fraser has pointed out, and Auditor Generals have pointed out as early as 1904, the federal government provides less funding for every public service, a significantly less funding than every other Canadian receives. So in education, children get 40 to 60 percent less if you're a First Nations child on reserve. In child welfare, it's 34.8 percent less than of other children. One in six First Nations communities don't have water. There are communities in Manitoba that have to use slop pails for toilets. And this isn't the richest country in the world. This inequity has gone on for, for years. And it's gone on uh, regardless of solutions that were available to the federal government. In our case, in the child welfare case, we had worked for over 10 years with over uh, 20, 30 experts to document the shortfall, the harms to children, which were, without the family services, they were going into child welfare care at record rates, and what the federal government could do to solve the problem. We uh, had 150 pages of economic spreadsheets showing how the formula would work. The federal government was running a surplus budget and they did not fix it. They did not fix it. Now this inequality has been perpetrated because most caring Canadians don't know it's there. In fact, they assume that First Nations are getting more than everybody else, right? And there's also some stereotypes out there that arise from that. Number one, that we're not grateful. We always want more money, right? Well, you could imagine, though, if it was your children who are receiving so much less, and they would give you a little bit more, but it still fell far short of what other children receive, wouldn't you be asking for more every year? What about financial management of First Nations? You know, that's a big one. There was the Financial First Nations Accountability Act, right? Um, and there are some First Nations people who don't manage their money well. There's probably some First Nations folks involved in fraud. But we're not alone in that. You know, I live in Ottawa. <laughs> and I read the paper quite often, and I have not seen Caucasian Male Financial Accountability Act yet. <laughs> but maybe that's something we need. And then there's this idea of complexity. And who here thinks kids are complex? Sometimes they are. But you know what? The recipe's been the same for thousands of years. They need lots of love. They need to feel like they belong somewhere, that they matter. Need some good food, some clean water, a warm bed to sleep in, and some toys to allow their imagination to grow wild. That's what kids need, right? But for these inequalities have been allowed to continue because the federal government says it's too complex. They say it's too complex to get water up into a northern First Nations community. But at the same time, when there's an earthquake halfway around the world, they fly a dart team there and get it pumping in 24 hours. So why can't they do the same thing for the community of Tyganega an hour and a half outside of Toronto? Right? The problem with stereotypes is it never invokes our curiosity. We never pierce through them. And that's why they're so powerful, and that's why these inequalities have been allowed to exist for children. But children aren't sucked in quite so easily. This is one of my heroes, Shannon Kustachin. Has anyone heard of this young girl? Yeah. I remember the very first time I met Shannon. She was uh, uh, down in Ottawa. And she was standing in the field of Victoria Island, which is one of the sacred islands for the Algonquin Nation. And she looked very much like she did there. Two long pink ponytails, and she had a, a protest sign with her. And she was fighting because the school on her community sat on a toxic waste dump of 30,000 gallons of diesel fuel. Now, in 2000, when this beautiful little girl would have started kindergarten, the Canadian government put portable trailers on the playground of that contaminated school. Can you imagine? Like, who would want their children? Like, literally, going to school on a playground that sit right next to a toxic waste dump. And the other side of the school ground was an active airstrip. Now, th these portable trailers were only supposed to be there for a few years until they built a new school. And three ministers of Indian Affairs promised these kids in new school, but they never delivered. 
But as Shannon says, by the time these children were in grade four and five, they started to internalize the racism. They started to believe that they were the problem. They started to believe that there was no hope for them, that they would never grow up to be anybody, and they started dropping out of school. But that just built a fire in this little girl. And so she kept writing to the government down in Ottawa, you know, we want to have a new school, we want to go somewhere safe, and we want to grow up and be someone important one day. Just uh, before her grade 8 graduation, the kids in her school had raised enough money to go uh, have, a, have a special graduation. And, and you can imagine they deserved it, didn't they? I mean, after going through all that horror in these rundown portable trailers with mice, with black mold, with ice, the heat going off, if you make it to grade 8, as far as I'm concerned, you deserve the Nobel Prize, right, in that situation. Now, one thing I'd like to say to you, uh, how many people here work with kids in remote areas? How, uh, okay, I grew up as a remote kid. I just want to tell you something. We kids, and particularly may I say we girls from remote communities, when we go on a special trip, we do not want to go to camp. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> you know, all these NGOs, let's send these native kids from these remote communities to camp. Good idea. Um, they, the, the kids had raised enough money so they could go to Niagara Falls. They wanted to go see uh, an IMAX theater. They wanted to see the falls and do all the things that city kids can do that were very unfamiliar to these children. But when a letter arrived from Indian Affairs saying that they couldn't afford a new school for Shannon and her friends, these 13-year-olds who had raised all this money and were about to graduate had their own private meeting and they decided they'd cancel their graduation party. And they would use the money to send Shannon and two young men down to meet with the Minister of Indian Affairs instead. They said it was far more important that the younger children had a school than it was that they had a party. They said it was too late for their childhoods, but it wasn't too late for the younger kids in their school. And so this is uh, Shannon, just after she met with Minister Stroll. Uh, she went into the meeting room, and as she said in the Globe and Mail quote of the week a few weeks later, she said, I think the minister was nervous. <laughs> because the first thing that he did was pointed out how big his office was. And she said, it is very nice, minister. I wish it was this nice for us who were trying to learn up and out of office step. It was clear the minister had other things to do, and so she just put it out there. She said, are you going to give us a new school or not? And he said, no, I can't afford it. And this beautiful girl, and she is beautiful in every way. She stood up, she re reached out to the minister's hand, she said, thank you for meeting with us today, minister, but I do not believe you and I will never give up because school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this. <laughs>